afternoon. Will everyone please stand? Let's join together in song. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Let's pray to God. Our 
God, the creator and sustainer of the universe. We thank you for revealing a little bit more of yourself to us through your servant, Edward. We thank you and we praise you today in the name of Jesus. Hear now the word of the Lord from Mark 1, verse 1. Arche tu euangeliu, Jesu Christu, puiu thabu. If we were sitting across the table from Edward and we just said what we said, we wouldn't read verse 2. We would immediately launch into about a five to ten minute conversation on a number of things surrounding that verse. In particular, first of all, the beauty of the Greek, the way it just flowed. Did you hear? Every word except the first word had an oo sound at the end, just, just flowed. We wouldn't even get to the meaning, we wouldn't get to translating first. It would just be, let's talk about the beauty of it. Because what that did initially is that it would bring in the listener. This was not meant to be read, you know, sitting at a table. This was meant to be heard. And so the fact that the listeners would hear that, it would immediately draw them in. They would immediately be drawn in to the beauty of the words so that then they could get to the meaning, which is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Son of God. Edward Fudge's immediately, immediate legacy will start tomorrow morning in this room when we at this church open, like many churches, Mark 1, verse 1. A few weeks ago, when I sat with Edward in his home, we talked about the Gospel of Mark. When I moved here, he found out that I did an undergraduate degree in Greek. And so immediately, just kind of past, hi, my name's Edward Fudge, let's start getting together once a week to read and translate. And so we did, and we started reading. Then a few weeks ago, during the last time that we were together, I said, I'm about to start preaching from the Gospel of Mark. You wanna just sit? Talk Mark for a while, and he did, no surprise. And one of the main things that we talked about is how in the Gospel of Mark, unlike the other Gospels, what really makes it stand out is that Jesus comes into Satan's territory in Galilee. And Mark tells the story of Jesus as an invader. Jesus comes in and invades Satan's territory. So that the people who are surrounded by all these things that whenever they look at it, they say, this is not the work of God, this is the work of Satan. Jesus comes in and says, not anymore. Not anymore. Because what I'm about to reveal to you is the power of God. And I think the beauty of that conversation is that that was Edward's life. I'll dedicate this upcoming sermon series to my friend Edward. Mainly because the legacy Edward leaves our church beginning tomorrow is not the story of Edward, but the story Edward wanted told more than any other. The good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And because our lives in Jesus are so interconnected, I think Edward experienced the presence of Jesus most apparently in his wife, Sarah Faye, his friend, Alex Schrader, has been so dear to him, helping to take care of him. And then so many other friends, family, daughter, son, grandchildren. The last passage of scripture Edward and I discussed was Psalm 103. So here's the ending of it. And I cannot help but picture that Edward sees this the ending of Psalm 103 today in a whole new light.
The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. We praise the Lord, O oh my soul, today in this place. But isn't it something to picture our brother Edward, not frail, not in pain, not in tears, but as the newest member of all of God's heavenly hosts, now counted among the mighty ones. Amen. 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 Edward William Fudge fell asleep in Jesus Christ on November 25th, 2017, at the age of 73, dressed in the righteousness of Christ by grace through faith. He was born on July 13th, 1944, in a country clinic in Leicester, Alabama, to Benjamin Benny Lee Fudge and Sybil Short Fudge. His mother was born and raised in Africa, daughter of missionaries. His father was a gospel preacher and a Christian publisher. Edward was born six weeks premature and at first could not take nourishment. God spared his life in answer to his parents' prayers and had his merciful hand on him for the rest of his life. His greatest earthly treasure was his wonderful family. He is survived by Sarah Faye Lockfetch, wife of 50 years, his greatest encourager and critic, daughter Melanie Ann Simpson and husband Michael of Katie. Son Jeremy Locke Fudge and wife Christy of Dallas, Texas. Six grandchildren, Julia Taylor Simpson and Ezekiel Locke Simpson of Katie. And Brenna Hollis Fudge, Addison Bell Fudge, Callie Marie Fudge and Delaney Michelle Fudge of Dallas. Mother, Sybil Fudge Dewurst, brothers Henry and wife Joanne, Robert and wife Diane, Benjamin and wife Susan, and Paul and wife Melanie, sister Nancy and husband Raymond, and a host of other relatives and friends. Himself a sinner saved by grace, Edward's life ambition was to serve God and to bring glory to Jesus Christ. He started preaching in 1960 as a junior in high school, and he preached and taught the Bible for the rest of his life. Edward graduated from Athens Bible School, Florida College, and Abilene Christian University, where he earned two degrees in biblical languages. He attended Covenant Theological Seminary in Eden Theological Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri. By God's enabling, he taught and preached in Christian churches across denominational spectrum, and lectured in Christian seminaries and universities in the United States, Canada, and New Zealand. For 21 years, he produced an internationally distributed email devotional called Grace Mail. He wrote numerous Christian books and published articles in Christianity Today and other popular and scholarly journals. Edwards Church family since 1982 was Bering Drive Church of Christ in Houston, where he served as a Bible teacher and as an elder for 18 years. With the congregation's moral support and encouragement, he ministered across the Christian church. In the providence of God, Edward earned a law degree from the University of Houston in 1988. And for the next 29 years, he practiced law with Jenkins and Gilchrist, Simmons and Fletcher, and the Lanier Law Firm. Special thanks to Angel, Kind, Vanessa, Yeme, Nola, and especially Daniel for their loving and diligent care over this past year. In lieu of flowers, Edward would have appreciated donations to Lifeline Chaplaincy, but equally so, Edward would have been pleased if you had helped a missionary, fed the poor, or cared for the hurting, for that was his heart. 
In God's own time, Edward will be resurrected and with all the saved in a glorified immortal body to live forever in the new heavens and the new earth. All glory to God. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's stand together as we sing. Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. From the Word of God, one of Edward's favorite passages. One thing I've asked from the Lord, that's what I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, to meditate in his temple, for in the day of trouble he will conceal me in his tabernacle, in the secret place of his tent. He will hide me, and he'll lift me up on a rock. And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, and be gracious to me and answer me. Because when you said, Lord, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. So do not hide your face from me, Lord. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not abandon me nor forsake me. 
O oh God of my salvation. Edward loved that passage, and I am honored to read it on his behalf this morning, this afternoon. I had to grab this little thing to keep me from crying with Edward's picture on it. I'm going to cherish that forever. When I first heard of this, of Edward's passing a week ago, probably about right now, last Saturday, that night I had a dream. Most of you won't believe this. I had a dream. I felt that I was up speaking at Edward's funeral, but nothing would come out but little words and little phrases like Opal Cadet GT. <laughs> Barbecue, which that's my business. Little words like uh, the barn, Lee Street, meeting place for Christians, grace. Just little words, and it was as if I was in a hurry to, to say those little words. The following day, Jeremy called me and told me that Edward had everything planned out, and I was given two minutes to speak. And I said, I didn't tell Jeremy, I didn't have the heart to tell him that the Lord had already warned me in a dream of Edward's plan. <laughs> I just got to take a little time to tell you that Edward was my instant friend from the first time that I actually met him. I saw him before I met him. Announcement at church caused me to go to a debate of all things. Should have been my last debate, but it wasn't. They had shanghaied Edward in a church building, deceived him into thinking that he was going to get to speak. Well, standing room only. I was against the back wall with my back against the wall in more ways than one. But I knew that I needed to hear from this man that everybody was against. That's where I heard that famous saying, you people remind me of St. Peter always falling asleep, but getting awake just in time to cut somebody's ear off. So I knew instantly that I had to meet the man that said that. What courage. That was supposed to have been in the movie, but Edward wanted it out, and I don't know why. I should have, I should have lobbied to got, get that in there. Then I went down to the CEI bookstore. I'd always bought books there, but I'd never got to meet Edward. And so Edward, as I was checking out a book, it was the New Testament commentary by Ellison and two other guys. I actually saw that very book in Edward's library last night and began to cry because that's when I met Edward, when I bought that book. And Edward came up to me and he said, uh, I've noticed that you don't buy the normal Church of Christ books. What's your name? I said, well, thank you. My name's Mark. <laughs> and so we hit it off right there in that room. And he invited me then to his Tuesday night Bible study, which led to the meeting on Lee Street, which was just a one-room thing about as big as half a third of this room. Then that led to the barn, what we call the Elm Street Church that was really not on Elm Street. <laughs> Little things just flood my heart and my soul and my wife Phyllis as well. We cried so much this week. Who can forget the gold Opal Cadet GT with the bent nail for a key that anybody could crank except it normally wouldn't crank? <laughs> How much time did I spend jumping that thing off? I'll never know. That thing should be found and enshrined enshrined. If they ever come up with a restoration history museum, that needs to be in it. Once Edward took me to an ETS convention. I don't, y'all know what that is? I didn't either. An ETS convention is where a lot of people that are a lot smarter than you get together and talk. He introduced me to William Lane. The first scholarly book I ever bought was William Lane's commentary on Mark. And he introduced me. And there I was, just an old barbecue cook, and William Lane, a young, not a young man, but a, a small man, a stature. Edward always loved to tell people how that happened. He, William, he introduced me to William Lane, and William Lane says, so, you're in New Testament studies too, eh? I said, no, I cook barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> and Edward would tell everybody how that went down from time to time. <laughs> 
But on the way up there, what I wanted to tell you was that on the way up there, Edward said right in the middle of going downtown Nashville, he said, Mark, I think we need to pray. And I said, well, okay, do you, you start. He said, okay. So I'm, I'm in the driver, uh, passenger side, and so I'm praying. Edward's praying. He's at praying out loud. And I look over, and Edward has his eyes closed. <laughs> and I said, wait, Edward. I'll pray. You drive. <laughs> One time Edward decided he was going to teach me how to speed read. And so I could do it, scanning with your hands, keywords, you know, just. And it finally hit that I could do it, and I did it. But I was, I broke out in a sweat. I was just wet all over. And I said, Edward, I don't want to speed read. I said, I could probably do this, but I believe I'd rather go down and clean out the pits at the barbecue place. Often we would grill out. Edward and Sarah Faye would come over or we'd go over there. Sometimes I'd cook steak. And you know how if you got people coming over, you always cook a little extra one maybe just in case. And so as they were leaving, Edward would always look down at that steak and he'd say, Mark, uh, what are you gonna do with, what are you gonna do with that steak? <laughs> I said, well, I don't know, Edward. Uh, well, if you're not gonna do anything with it, I'll be glad to take it home. <laughs> That's kind of the way it went. Also, Edward, one time, Sarah Faye might remember this, he decided he wanted to quit his job at Decatur Printing as typesetter and become a cook out there at the barbecue place. And he said, I tell you what we'll do, Mark. You just pay my normal salary, and I'll teach you Greek while we're turning the meat, just if you'll give me something to take home at night to eat. Luckily, Sarah Faye put a stop to that. That wouldn't have went well for either one of us, probably. I'll close with this. I have to tell you, though, the real impact that Edward had on my life. There's no way that I could fly out here to your little airport out here at Bush <laughs> and, and not tell you what impact Edward Fudge had on my life. You see, the, the night that I was baptized, my hair still wet, dripping with water, well-intending gentlemen come to me and say, Mark, we're so glad you're here to join the fight. You need to get your boxing gloves on. There's a fight waging a spiritual battle. It was not a spiritual battle, it was a physical battle. I fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. They said it was some movement called Unity and Diversity. 19 years old, I'm hearing this. Harris to it. And one of the proponents of this is Edward Fudge, and you need to get your boxing gloves on, we gotta fight. I didn't want to fight, but I did want to meet the man that everybody wanted to talk about. So make no mistake about it. When I met Edward, it changed my life. I no longer wanted to fight a battle against unity and diversity. I wanted to join up. He was that kind of man. He could turn a heart if you listen to him, he could turn a person around right there on the spot, and he did in my life. He is truly and was God's messenger, sent to me personally with the keys to open the gates and the bars that held me to legalism. Held me captive, but he released me to a life of spirit-fed, spirit-controlled life of love. Edward introduced me to the real Jesus in his commentary of Our Man in Heaven, to that Jesus that turned my life around. Not one who wanted to put on boxing gloves, but one who wanted to love. Two small words in the text of Scripture I came across. Edward put, handed me this book called, one little pamphlet called One Life, One Death, One Judgment. And it changed my life by two little words. You see in there, he quotes Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. So Christ. Those two words, so Christ. You see, he did it for us. When I began to think about how odd it sounded that Jesus was judged, just like any man lives and then dies and then is judged, so it is with Christ. That 
thinking changed my life. Just because he put that little thing in a little bitty footnote that you could hardly read in the bottom of that pamphlet on one page changed my life. Edward taught me that salvation was outside of myself, but inside Jesus. And to accomplish salvation, which was a fact, had already been done. And faith in that saves. That was the essence that changed my life. Faith in the Christ event is where salvation resides. Thank you, Edward, for teaching me that and for loving me. His mother, Sybil, is here. She said it so correctly last night and appropriately that Edward's heart was the same heart of Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. You've seen him weep, I'm sure. Thank you, Edward, for being my friend, for my brother, for my mentor, and truly being God's prophetic voice in our time. I love you, Edward. from the book of Isaiah. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the Creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted but those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The word of the Lord. Edward would have been the first to explain that waiting on the Lord here does not mean kicking your feet up and leaning back and crossing your arms over your chest to see what comes next. Rather, waiting upon the Lord has more to do with service. In fact, we still use those two words as synonyms. When you're in a fine restaurant waiting for your waiter, you're also waiting for your server. And that's what it means to serve the Lord, to wait for the Lord. So those who serve the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Speaking of service, my favorite grace mail is the one that Edward wrote just a few weeks ago. You'll probably remember it. It's dated June 20th, 2017. It's called Surprise Guests at Jesus Party. I want to read a few excerpts from it. Jesus shattered the assumptions of his opponents with his unexpected predictions concerning guests who will share the heavenly banquet as described in Luke 13. Many, quote, from the East and West, end quote, will sit down alongside Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jesus assured his incredulous adversaries, who Jesus said would be tossed out of the celebration altogether. 
Remember, these are the folks who expected to approve God's guest list. It was inconceivable to them that they would not head that list. Jesus' words came to mind recently when one of my caregivers, a Buddhist lady, spontaneously explained her motivation, which parallels that of several of her Christian counterparts. They all chose this work of service, they told me, because they truly cared for their people. This is not just a job for them. They see it as service to God. The benefits of Jesus' atoning work will reach to the ends of the earth. His atonement and salvation will certainly include people who never heard about it in this life. Godly Jews and Gentiles who lived and died before Jesus, children who die pre-birth or in infancy, and anyone else God sees fit to include from, quote, the East and the West, end quote. To say this does not cheapen or weaken Christ's unique role as Savior. Instead, it magnifies and underscores the expansive generosity of our great God and Savior. And when we reach that heavenly banquet scene ourselves, I will not the least be surprised to discover among those redeemed by Jesus, the Far East, my Buddhist friend, who serves to please and honor God. A few days after this post, I wrote Edward. And I said on June 25th, Edward, this is the second of the two truths I've embraced in adulthood that makes sense of the traditional gospel. One, hell is annihilation. Two, unrestricted grace does not compromise the doctrine of and need for propitiation. It also explains Paul's respectful address on Mars Hill. God could have spoken to me through other means, of course, but he chose you. And I am most grateful to God and to you for that. Edward wrote back on July 3rd. Dear Jerry, my old friend, I am blessed and honored to have you in my life, which is full of precious memories involving you for over 55 years. Love, Edward. I wrote back the next day. I said, thanks, Edward, but don't get the big head because I told you God spoke to me through you. He once spoke through the mouth of an ass, you know. <laughs> that afternoon, <laughs> Edward wrote me back and said, as Seraphim was typing my response to your first post, she reminded me of that very fact. <laughs> you beat me to it. <laughs> so let me inform you that had it not been for the stalwart efforts of Sarah Fay and me to humble Edward, <laughs> you all would have had a big problem on your hands. And I think Mark and maybe a few others would fit that category. You're welcome. <laughs> Let me also share with you this morning 
this afternoon. That when I discovered the Book of Common Prayer, I stopped saying, passed away, and started saying, death. Not unlike the Bible, the Book of Common Prayer uses the word death. And I became very familiar with that part, that liturgy. That is at the death, the ministration of death. And it's a beautiful goodbye service. I suggest to you today that of all the people on the earth, we alone know who death is. We ought to be able to look it in the eye and call it by name and say, death, we know your power. You weaken us, you grieve us, you even made the Son of God weep. You buckle our knees But we own you. And the reason for that is that God, with the strength of his might, raised Christ from the dead to sit with him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And he gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. And therefore we can say like Paul, that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And those of us who are left should be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And Paul says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That's good news about death. And I share it with you this, morning, this afternoon in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
reading this afternoon from 2 Corinthians 5. Now, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I have to restrain my enthusiasm for the profound theology in these verses. Uh, and uh, by sticking closely to my notes, I will limit myself to two essential phrases within those verses. Ministry of reconciliation and ambassador for Christ. Edward personified both. As an ambassador for Christ, Edward represented his Savior in word and in deed in both his personal and his public life. Through his lectures and his literature, he challenged traditional views of a eternally vengeful God and introduced readers and listeners to a just and merciful Heavenly Father. Thus he was not only an ambassador but a minister of reconciliation. I know in the case of many people he cleared the way for them to love a God that they feared and could not love until they understood what he was really like. The personal legacy of Edward Fudge can be seen, of course, in the lives and the characters of his children and grandchildren and others over whom he had some influence. But I want to take just a few moments here to talk about another legacy. Edward has put an indelible mark on evangelical theology. His research on the doctrine of hell four decades ago. Uh, the doctrine of hell is found in the Bible and other ancient literature. Led him to reject the traditional teachings about the nature of man and the character of God. And he thus became a proponent of something called conditional immortality. The concept that man is not inherently, naturally immortal. He upheld Jesus Christ as the only way to eternal life. Edward denied the doctrine of eternal torment for the lost. He became an annihilationist, insisting that the ultimate punishment for the lost will be eternal death, oblivion, not eternal torment. Edward's landmark book, The Fire That Consumes, is now in its third edition. It was first published 35 years ago. And during that time, Edward Fudge has stood in the vanguard of an international movement, a movement away from traditional views of hell, torment, the nature of man. He will long remain a hero for those who try to fill his shoes as a champion of truth in these areas. 
Edward knew that we are all caught up in, in a great war, in the big picture. A battle between good and evil on a grand scale. A war between God and Satan. And this is a war that will rage on until Jesus comes and finally puts an end to it. We live in dangerous territory. All of us get hurt in one way or another. Collateral damage, you might say. But Edward was a particular target of enemy fire. His years of physical suffering and emotional anguish could have made him bitter. It happens, but not Edward. He believed and trusted in his Heavenly Father with a resilient faith that bounced back again and again regardless of depression and discouragement. He was buoyed up by gratitude for the assurance of salvation in Jesus. His insistent prayers, even in the darkest of times, rose up to the throne of God as highest praise. Edward Fudge's life is now a matter of record. It's, it's like the first sentence in a book with an infinite number of pages. Nouns and verbs named, action stopped, subject and predicate complete. A period at the end. We wait. We count the days, weeks, months, years. Not Edward. Not anymore. We're prisoners of time. But he is not. For him, a flash of timelessness and a bright awakening on Resurrection Day. There is ever so much more to be told about Edward Fudge, a never-ending story. Edward Fudge, husband, son, father, grandfather, brother, lawyer, theologian, man of God, friend. I met Edward a little over 33 years ago in this place. I don't know that I've ever met a cleverer man. Quick, witty, smart. I remember opening the door for him one time. We were walking in together. I said, age before beauty. He didn't miss a beat. He walked right in front of me. He said, no, it's pearls before swine. <laughs> Never knew anybody as excited over the word of God as Edward Fudge. Lynn Mitchell said, when Edward teaches, whatever he's teaching on, you just build it into this sentence. If Edward's teaching on marriage, if Edward's teaching on hell, if Edward's teaching on heaven, if Edward's teaching on the atonement, you fill it in with this. Everything the Bible says about blank, from Genesis to Revelation, <laughs> because you're gonna be drinking out of a fire hydrant when Edward teaches, and that is true. Edward and I used to play a game we called the memory game, where either we'd have a third person or each other would read a scripture. And we'd see who could identify where it came from. You'd get one point for the book. I mean, come on, that's not that big a deal. You'd get five points for the chapter. And if you could get the verse, the game's over, you win. Now, Edward was amazing. And I learned real early, don't ever read anything out of Hebrews to Edward. <laughs> the game is over. So I was really honored to be asked by Jeremy and the family and, and Edward, I guess, to read from Hebrews in his honor. 
Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There's a lot I'll miss about having Edward's presence even though he has indelibly changed my life as well as many others. I do a written lesson generally each week and I would email it to Edward and as recently as a month or so ago always comments which means Sarah Faye I guess you typed a lot of those thank you but uh, constant encouragement and a constant source of ideas and, and knowledge his book the fire that consumes uh, Jim I was one of those people who got it 30 some odd years ago and overnight couldn't put it down I mean it, it's thick the original one that hardcover it was thick and it changed my mind it, it, I, I read it and it's like whoa well duh why didn't we ever know this before and I thank Robert W. Brinsme for hiring him to do that uh, Edward and I had fun throughout the years dealing with that and recently a commentary came out in the New International Greek Testament on the book of Revelation by Beale. And when it came out, I mean, Ed Edward is a thoroughbred in this. I mean, he's, he's a stud worldwide on these issues. And the book came out and it cites Edward Fudge multiple times. And one time in particular takes issue with Edward on a passage and how Edward interprets it. It's on page 762. It says, I'm against Edward Fudge in the fire that consumes, page 307, who defines this as lifeless desolation, proceeds to tell why. And when I pointed it out to Edward, he just snickered as he has a way of doing it and says, well, he hasn't read my new edition yet <laughs> because I've just dismantled his argument. I said, Edward, and we were at a, theological library up northwest of town and uh, which which we built so we kind of express some ownership type concept so I pulled the commentary off of the shelf and I said Edward you need to write in here your response and he said I can't write in a library book I said Edward we own the library you can write in a library book he said my mom will get so upset with me. And I said, your mom's never going to know. So Edward, I mean, he's looking to see if anybody's looking, and he gets that little mischievous little boy smirk on his face. And he puts an asterisk in the book. And then down at the bottom, he says, wait until you read the new edition. Edward Fudge. <laughs> and bless his heart, I've had so much fun with him ever since. He would come to the library, there'd be um, outstanding speakers that, that Edward would come here and they'd be so honored that Edward was there because these people from all around the world knew Edward. N.T. Wright, uh, just Alistair McGrath, a number of different people and I would tell a number of them, be real careful with Edward, he'll write in your library books. <laughs> and he would just look aghast like, no, he told me to, he told me to. Oh, I loved him. I loved him. I got an email this week from a judge in Harris County who said Edward tried a case in his court well over a decade ago now. And he says it still stands out in my mind he was such a gentleman and yet such a voracious advocate. And he said, the grace of God was evident in the man. And I told the judge that I would mention that today. 
Uh, I miss Edward as a friend. I miss him as a lawyer. Uh, he practiced law with us for a, a long time. And I always loved it because he would call me periodically and I'd never know why he was calling. I didn't know if it was about a case, uh, which oftentimes it was, or about how you take a Greek verb and turn it into an adverb and what are the grammatical rules for it because he was trying to parse through some sentence or something and we had a lot of fun. Uh, I found out about Edward's death last Saturday and it was a serendipitous moment for me. Uh, uh, last year I had written a a devotional book uh, that Baylor graciously published, but I'd written it with my adult children in mind. We have five children. And it has a devotional for each day of the year, and each devotional is, is kind of targeted, well, it's all out of, a, of the Psalms, so we go through the Psalms, but each devotional is targeted to, to personal experiences and my understanding of those Psalms. And, and uh, the one last Saturday, on the day of Edward's passing, is a one that's all about Edward Fudge and the effect that he had on me in a tremendous way. And I didn't name him in it, um, but when Jeremy called me, uh, I told Jeremy about that. And, and it, was a, it was a really neat, neat story because Edward Fudge, um, I used to, to go to church here a, a good long while ago and was part of the preaching rotation on Sunday nights that Bill Love had. Every six weeks, I think, my night would come up and I'd get to, to preach. And uh, uh, Edward called me one day and he said, I want to have lunch with you. And I thought, wow, how cool is that? Because Edward, you know, I, I won't say I idolized him, but I saw him as a mentor and I, I had great respect for him and I would have said I idolized him except he'd tell me that's against the Ten Commandments and I'm not allowed to. So <laughs> instead I'll just say I respected him and loved him as a mentor and an inspiration to me. And so I was so excited about going to lunch and we went to lunch and he sat down with me at this ratty little barbecue place in downtown Houston so I guess that's consistent. and. Um, he said to me, he said, Mark, uh, I'm concerned that sometimes when you preach, you come off flippant. And he was dead earnest. And I was like, oh my goodness, I have let down this man that I have so much respect for. And he did it in such a loving, gracious, kind way that it did not cause me to bow my back, to get defensive. It caused me to say, if I'm doing that, I need to change the way I do things. Because what we're talking about is not anything to be flippant about. It's something to, to be uh, exalting, to be praising, to enjoy, to delight in, to revere, to awe, to fear, but not be flippant. And he changed the way I taught, and he changed the way I preached. And it wasn't simply by willing to tell me a hard message I needed to hear, but it's the love and the kindness and the way he went about doing it. And that's Edward Fudge. And the world is a different place because of his thumbprint, which God made, but Edward placed by the grace and strength of God. God bless you all. Amen. When Melanie called me last Saturday and told me about Edward's passing, excuse me, Jerry, the, so many things went through my mind and a song came to me. Will y'all help me with it? Precious memories, how they linger, how they ever flood my soul. In the stillness of the midnight, precious sacred, 
sacred scenes unfold. I guess among the people here today, except for Edward's mother and, and his, some of his brothers, I've known Edward longer than anyone. A little, just a little bit of background. We moved to Alabama in 1952 from Tennessee, and my mother had an AM radio. She tuned it in during the week at 7.30 on the dial, which was just a little bit off of 6.50, which was WSM in Nashville, which was one of the radio stations we all listened to. But she heard something at 9 o'clock every morning on WJMW in Athens. It was young people singing gospel songs, followed by a lesson. My mother thought, well, it sure would be nice if my children could go to a school like that. And by the providence of God, we moved to Alabama, moved to Huntsville, Alabama. She looked out the door one morning, there went a big yellow school bus, Athens Bible School, right across the side of it. For two years, my brother and I rode that bus, which sometimes took two hours round the trip there and back, to go to Athens Bible School and become a part of it. I didn't know anyone at Athens Bible School. In the fall of 1952, eight years old, when I got there, I was kind of alone. I didn't, didn't know anybody. But I saw this funny looking little blonde headed guy running around all over the place, going up to adults and talking to them, just like he knew everybody and he knew everything. And I come to find out later, he didn't know everybody and everything. <laughs> because his father, was president of Athens Bible School and the co-founder of Athens Bible School from 1943. Next year, Athens Bible School will celebrate 75 years of Christian education. They're in the process of building a multi-million dollar facility there in Athens. Credit to this Fudge family, which has meant so much to me throughout the years who have left a big footprint in Limestone County, Alabama. To give you a little bit of a background of how we were raised, there was a Bible class every morning, first at eight o'clock. Then at nine o'clock, there was a chapel program, the one my mother would listen to on the radio. And so, that was, and, and we had to memorize all of these things. Matter of fact, Edward had already memorized the Greek alphabet by the time he was five or six years old. But we were exposed to a lot of gospel. There were gospel meetings going on all year long, and typically they would last two weeks, sometimes morning and evening, and different churches would have them, and we not only would our own church, we'd go visit the others. So by the time we were in the fourth or fifth grade, we knew more Bible than most people get in a lifetime. And we memorized those things. And Edward and I were very much friends early on, but we were different. We were almost polar opposites. Edward was very intellectual. I was not intellectual, period. <laughs> I was more athletic. Edward was Definitely not athletic. Brother Jim Wood asked me one time when I were filming the movie, was Edward very athletic? And I said, well, no. I said, on a good day, he could probably throw a football the length of my pickup truck. <laughs> His claim to fame was he didn't know how to play ping pong, and he was a pretty good ping pong player. In the seventh or eighth grade, we were asked to write an essay, and I had to look it up. What is an essay? But Edward already had his figured out and what it was. It was in defense of the New Testament canon, seventh or eighth grade. That tells you something about his ability. But he was my conscience so many times. We were close, even though we were different. And he was my conscience. When we finally moved into the neighborhood where uh, we both grew up, 
I, in the summertime, had normally would get on my bicycle and I'd ride around the neighborhood with my typical attire, which was a pair of shorts and some tennis shoes without a shirt. I didn't think anything about it, 10 years old, you know. So I ride down to the neighborhood and look Edward up and he says, what are you doing without your shirt on? How was I supposed to know there were five Church of Christ preachers that lived on that same street? <laughs> it was referred to as Campbellite Hill by those outside, <laughs> outsiders. But he was always part of my conscience. I had a tendency to swerve from the right hand to the left hand at any given time. But Edward knew what was right and he helped me in that regard. Edward was baptized at an early age and we had all this Bible knowledge and he kept asking, Joey, when are you going to be baptized? When are you going to be baptized? And of course I was coordinating all of this with my mother who felt like I needed to wait a little while longer, but he was so glad when he found out that, that I had been baptized. Edward is in high school. We had a literature teacher, A.J. Rollins, who was also one of the founders of Athens Bible School. And he loved literature. He was our Bible teacher as well as our literature teacher. Loved memorizing. For a final exam, we had a book. I think there was somewhere in the neighborhood of 180 to 200 Bible verses that we had to memorize in order to graduate. Well, Edward had already memorized them anyway. But that was part of it, part of our, our curriculum. But in the literature class, Brother Rollins would come in and begin a poem. And as an example, then atop to him who in the blank of nature holds blank with her visible blank. And we'd have to fill in all the blanks to that poem. And Edward always made 100 on all the tests. Brother Rollins said, I'm going to fix Edward. I don't know if you know about these old textbooks. But these old hardback textbooks in the very back cover was a little label. And on that label was some information about the publisher. <laughs> the name of the publisher, the copyright information, and several things, several lines of information. So on one test that we had, Brother Rollins came in, and one of the questions was some, uh, about the information on that little label in the back cover of our textbook. Edward was the only one that got it right. <laughs> We were roommates in college, graduated from high school together, roommates in college, which was quite an experience as well. And Edward would, uh, he was, of course, like most young men, was interested in girls, and he would date someone. He'd come back and say, hey, what do you think of her? Mm, I don't know about her, Edward. So he would go with somebody else. Well, what do you think about her? I, I don't know, she doesn't seem right for you. Finally. One day he came in and said, what do you think about Sarah Fay? I said, Edward, she's a keeper. Uh, you're welcome, Melanie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sang, uh, uh, we had a family quartet, and they asked us to sing at Sarah Fay and Edward's wedding there in Franklin, Tennessee. And so, it, when I, met my future wife. Edward and Sarah Faye were living in Kirkwood, Missouri. I called Edward up and I said, Edward, I'm, I'm going to get married. I, I want you to come down and perform the ceremony for us. And he said, uh, who are you going to marry? And I told him, he said, well, is she a Christian? And I said, well, she's a Baptist. <laughs> There's a little slight pause there and Edward said, well, those Baptists sure have pretty legs. <laughs> but Edward was a spiritual mentor to me, as Mark and others have expressed. If you ask him a biblical question, don't expect a short answer. I was asked to help minister at this little country congregation. Had no idea what I was getting into. That was 40 years ago. I didn't know how to give a lesson. I knew, I knew a lot of Bible, but I'd had no experience in, in delivering messages and teaching classes and everything. But Edward and I lived just down the street from each other, and he had these little sermon outline books that saved me. <laughs> and so every, every few weeks, he would bring me one. 
sermons to grow on, Sunday night sermons, sermons that strengthen. They may be half a dozen or so sermon outlines in these little books. And so from that, he helped me immensely. When Edward Rudd had finished his manuscript on the fire that consumes, he came down the street and gave it to me, and I read over it. And I got pretty much to the end, and I said, Edward, about the uh, final destination of the wicked. And I said, Edward, is this what you believe? And he said, it's not a matter of what I believe. It's what the Bible says. And that is what Edward was all about. What does the Bible say? Part of me, I feel like part of me departed with Edward last Saturday, but he sure left me a lot more that remains with me today and will be with me all my life, for which I will be eternally grateful. Edward, in, in the senior yearbooks, was chosen the most likely to succeed and Edward, my friend, mission accomplished. Amen. First Peter 1, 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, which is, which is perishable even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your soul. Stand and sing.
tell you about my pop. He was so nice and funny. He would put a smile on my face all the time. He would never lie. He was the best pop. He was the best pop ever, and he was so good. He's with the angels, God, and Jesus. Pop would look up to God and also pray. Pop would never give up. The life was hard. His heart was a bowl of joy for me. Pop would help out others and had good friendship. He loved everybody. Thank you. Hello, my name is Addison Bell Fudge and I'm Edward's granddaughter. Edward Bo's dad, Pop Pop Pop. He was remembered greatly by those names and many others. For as long as I can remember, he's been known by Pop to me. One of my favorite memories I have of Pop is whether we were at a family reunion or just at their house, he would get everyone together to pray and share a word from the Bible with all of us. John 14 says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that you may also be where I am. And you know the way to where I'm going. We shall remember these words to help remind us Pop is in heaven now and will be watching over each and every one of us. While we all wish he was back with us, we know he is now ha happy, healthy, and pain-free in heaven. I'm asking myself, why Pop? The answer is simple. God has a plan for all of us. The memory of the last prayer he said to me was the day of Thanksgiving, and the last time I saw him was the Friday after Thanksgiving. The 11 years he's been a part of my life have been so special and I will cherish them forever. I will always remember the way he would call me Addie Bell, and I'll cling to all the love he gave to us. I love you, Papa, you will be remembered forever. Um, hi everyone, my name is Brenna, and Edward Pop was my grandfather. Um, Pop was in a lot of pain, but now he's up in heaven with his dad and out of his pain, watching over each and every one of us. I know that God has a plan and that we all need to stay faithful in him, and we need to love him even more in all these hard times. Uh, Pop was a great man and funny, even when he was in a lot of pain, and always tried to lift my spirits. Um, I have two verses I want to share with y'all. Um, Revelations 22, 4 says, He will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old of older things has passed away. And then Romans 8, 28 says, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, and that we have been called according to his purpose. Um, on Thanksgiving, two days before he passed away, Addie, my sister, and then Julia, my cousin, we went on a walk around um, Nana and Pop's neighborhood. We had been gone for around 15 minutes, and Pop started saying that they should send out a search party for us. <laughs> Um, Nana would always call him a nervous Nelly. Everyone disagreed with him, and we came back 10 minutes later. That showed me how much um, Pop had cared for us. I have many memories of him, and I will cherish them forever. Pop was a great guy and grandpa, and he will always have a special place in my heart. Well, those are some tough acts to follow, and Dad's a tough act to follow. Uh, he, he had handpicked all of those guys, and they were all dear, long-term friends to him. But I definitely think he must have known you all well enough to say, limit it to two to three minutes. Because <laughs> this is the longest memorial service ever, I think. And unfortunately, I'm long, so. Several years ago, Dad wrote both his obituary, which Ann read, and his memorial service today. Uh, and in his notes, he wrote that he didn't expect any of our family to speak today because if he was in the same position, he wouldn't be able to speak either. Anyone that spent any time with him knows that he often cried happy tears, and I inherited that in large part from him as well. So listen to him talk this morning about his happy tears. This was with Eric McTaxis uh, earlier this year. Hey folks, this is Eric Metaxas Show. We're talking about that controversial subject, uh, the doctrine of hell. I have the joy of speaking with Edward Fudge, who has written numerous books uh, on the subject. Mr. Fudge, once again, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, sir. It's great to be with you. I have to, I have to ask you, uh, you, you told me off the, uh, off the air that you have uh, Parkinson's, and uh, then I asked you about your voice changes sometimes. It sounds like you're, you're getting weepy, and you said that's exactly correct. When you're talking about eternity, uh, sometimes you get choked up. Yes, that's true. When I'm teaching in a church or seminary or lecture, 
sometimes I tell people at the beginning I may cry, and if I do, don't tell you anything about it. These are happy tears. But when I speak of the Lord Jesus and his sacrifice and his redemption, I cannot help but, but sometimes have a few tears. I have to tell you, I, I wish um, that I pray that, uh, that the Lord would give me that, uh, that same gift. And so I may have some happy tears, I may have some sad tears up here, but um, I'm just my dad's son, I guess. I don't think my words can do justice to the unique essence of dad, so I'm going to let him speak for himself at times, um, which I think would have tickled him. You guys know he likes seeing himself in movies. (laughs) So here's how I think he would have started today. Thank you for coming today. If I had gotten here and nobody showed up, it was going to be very embarrassing. It would be impossible to stand up here and in a matter of few minutes, which is all he wanted us to have, tell you all the stories and memories I had of Dad and recap all the conversations, experiences, moments, and even unspoken looks we shared. I started to think through my life and all the stories I could share and finally gave up. It's like trying to count the stars in the sky. Suffice to say, the Lord abundantly blessed me and Melanie with a loving, fun, compassionate, faithful, Christ-centered dad that poured his life into ministry and into his family. I haven't had other dads to compare, of course, but in taking stock of others I have met, I honestly can't imagine having had a better dad. Without a doubt, we are all so fortunate to have had the dad we had, the husband we had, the son or brother we had, the friend we had, the mentor and role model we had, and the biblical Google incarnate we had. And that's just my own 42 years with him. Some had less, some had more. 50 plus in mom's case, 73 in his mom's case, and others all in between. I've heard stories about dad this week that I didn't even know about, some even this morning. Collectively, all of our experiences and memories of them weave together a tapestry of his impact that could seemingly cover the earth. But no matter when your path in life intersected with his, the themes of all the stories about him are the same. His love for God, his steadfast faith in him no matter what may come, his dedication to the message of God's undeserved kindness to sinners and his, resurrection, his hope for Resurrection Day, all manifested through his love of the Bible, his love of family, and his love of others. My mind this week went to Matthew 22. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Of these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. In years past, those verses seemed somehow overly simplistic. How can 66 books of the Bible all boil down to that, Jesus? But those verses jumped off the page this week in considering Dad's life and the legacy he lives, leaves, for that's what Dad did. He loved God with all his heart and soul and mind. He was driven by his passion to, quote, live in his service to God's glory and the benefit of many people, as he wrote me once. Even when he was working other jobs as his occupation, His vocation was always his written and speaking ministry and seeking out the Lord's will for his next opportunity to be of service and to give him glory. Listen to how he explains one such time while in the middle of his occupational work. I think a couple of things probably, Mark. First of all, it was an unbroken succession of interest in Hebrews those 35 years. I preached on it, taught on it, read it, loved it, studied it. It just, uh, it's probably my favorite book in the whole Bible. So it was, it was never a break in a sense, but what really triggered this uh, commentary was uh, two years ago uh, in 2007 at our Lanier Law Firm retreat in Guatemala, I was out walking one morning about 6 o'clock down the cobblestone streets of Antigua, and nobody was up yet much, and I was praying, and particularly I was praying, asking God for a project that He wanted me to do next to serve Him. Uh, dear, the <laughs> Next couple of hours uh, or three hours, at least by noon, I was very impressed in my mind and heart that this is what I should do, revise that Hebrews commentary. Praying for a project that he wanted me to do next to serve him. Oh, that we would all emulate Dad. He lived Paul's words to live as Christ and to die as gain. He lived 73 years as God's ambassador and packed packed it as full as he could to glorify God. He truly meant it when he prayed, Thy will be done. Even his massive work on hell was ultimately motivated by his love of the Father, as he says here. 
Why does it matter? Three reasons. Because we say we're speaking for God. We need to be careful we say what God says. Second, because there have been atheists and many people turned away from the gospel because of the traditional doctrine of hell. It's an impediment to evangelism. Third and most important, the character of God is at stake. If you had a babysitter who told your children, if you don't obey me, I'm going to tell your parents, and when they get home, they're going to drive nails through your feet, cut off your ears with wire pliers, and put you in the microwave till you pop, what would you think of that babysitter? Not much. What do you think God thinks about it when people say that the God who gave his son to save people from their sin is going to put them in a place where he keeps them alive forever just to torment them and never let them die? That's not the God of the Bible. That's, that's not the Father of Jesus Christ. That's not the God we worship. We serve the living and true God who gives eternal life through his son. All thanks and praise to him. Amen. And he loved and cared for his neighbor in both big and little ways. His family first, and then I'm sure thousands that crossed his path in his 73 years. Melanie and I were molded by our observing his passion for quietly helping others, supporting missionaries around the world, praying with people, counseling his Grace Mail subscribers, and maximizing his God-ordained interactions with strangers on airplanes and in car rides who were in need of encouragement or wisdom. He always stuck up for the underdog, the less fortunate, the struggling, the downtrodden, the ragamuffins. Praying for them, sometimes specifically, many times generically, was a hallmark of any prayer that I ever heard him pray. What I marvel at perhaps most is how God had nearly perfectly balanced all these attributes in him. Some men are brilliant Bible scholars, but come across as arrogant, or aloof, or preachy. Dad was neither, as he zigzagged through the Bible, tying together one scripture after another from memory to tell the story of God's redemptive work in such a simple way that even a child could understand it, and with grace and gentleness, even if others held differing views. Some men are focused on their careers or ministries and detached from their families, but Dad poured out his love to us, constantly affirming, encouraging, and supporting us in our own journeys through life. Some men are dreamers and skew hard work to support their families. Dad worked his tail off his whole life to provide for us, but still loved nature and all of God's creation and their creations like peanut butter pie or any pie. <laughs> Some men are serious all the time, but Dad, while serious when necessary, loved having fun and being funny, telling corny jokes and puns, goofing around, playing rummy Cuban card games, or reciting Thanatopsis with a coffee cup on his head. To him who in the love of nature holds communion with her visible forms, she speaks with various <laughs> language for his gayer hours, has a voice of gladness and a smile, an eloquence of beauty that glides into his musing it steals away their sharpness. There he is aware. The thoughts of the last bitter hour come like a blight over thy spirit. The thoughts of the stern agony that shroud the pall. Paul, breathless darkness in the de death house make thee shudder and grow sick at heart. Go forth under the open sky and listen to nature's teaching while from all around earth and their waters and the depths of it, that still air come a quiet voice. Yet a few days and thee the all beholding sun shall see no more. <laughs> And he put it back on and he finished the poem. <laughs> we don't have time for that. And some men, when faced with sickness, disease, or adversity, lose faith or become bitter at God. But Dad faced his challenges with grace and humor. Uh, some people look at the glass and say it's half empty. Some people look at the glass and say it's half full. If I said the glass was half empty, I would say I've had four surgeries in the last 10 years for, for sinuses, spine problems, and skin cancer atrial fibrillation, a tiny stroke, Parkinson's, asthma, and six bulging discs. But that would not be the way to look at it. So I'll say the glass Who's is, keeping count? The glass is half full, and I would say I'm glad to report that other than my brain, my heart, my lungs, my skin, and my spine, I'm in perfect health. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't remember if I mentioned Parkinson's a while ago. Yeah, that's why my legs are shaking and anything else that shakes along the way. <laughs> I'm, I'm not scared or timid. I'm used to speaking in public. Uh, I, there are advantages to Parkinson's. Uh, I'm the only one in the family who can bounce our grandchildren on my knee without doing anything. <laughs> and, and, I, and I'm trying out a Parkinson's diet. You eat what you can get in your mouth. <laughs> Paul said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. 
I'll try to emulate Dad, as he's the closest picture of Jesus I've ever seen. Not because of his spiritual achievements or because he was somehow righteous on his own, but because he loved God, humbly walking with him daily through highs and lows, good and bad, times of struggle and times of refreshment. He lapped up Jesus' love like Delaney runs to my arms. And he boldly walked in faith and confidence of who he was, why he was here, and where he was going. He considered himself just one of many imperfect humans for God to use for his own glory. It seemed to me from my perspective and vantage point that for the first 25 years, nobody mentioned it. <laughs> but then in the last five or 10 years, it's uh, really become much more mentioned. And, uh, and to me, it all just shows that God uses uh, anybody he wants to, whether they're obscure or not, to do what he wants them to do in his power and strength. <laughs> and strength. And he gets the praise and his work gets done as he sees fit. Yeah. And then Jeremiah, at the end of Paul's discussion, he quotes Jeremiah's verse, which says, let the one who glories, glory in the Lord. And that's what we do, and that's what we can do and are privileged to do, because Paul says in the very last verse of 1 Corinthians 1, For God has made Jesus to be for us our righteousness and wisdom and sanctification and redemption. So let the one who glories, glory in the Lord. We don't need to be proud of anything else, because <laughs> nothing else is worth being proud of. And Paul says that for himself in Philippians chapter 3 when he gives his own credentials. And it's an impressive list. No Jew could do better. And then he comes to the end of that and says, but what I counted is in the prophet column. I put in the lost column. It's all just trash to be thrown out. Jesus is all that matters anymore. And that's what we want to say. That's what we want to sing. That's what's true of us. And it's good that we understand it and live by it, and God is glorified, and we are blessed, and we have his fellowship and companionship all the days of our life, and then he takes us to be with him forever, and that's enough to be said, so I'll stop. Amen. Amen. Dad, you fought the good fight. You finished the race. You got the faith. Now rest peacefully like a child sleeping in your parents' lap, as you used to describe it to awaken to your Savior's open arms in your crown of righteousness. Amen and amen. Thank you all for being here and sitting through a very long service. Um, we would like you to join us in the fellowship hall uh, as soon as we conclude, um, where the family will be and food and dad would be excited. There's dessert waiting for us, I'm sure. Um, there's a lot of many sermons today. I think Dad would have wanted to have the last one, so we're going to close with him leading us in a benediction, um, preaching with power, as one of his booklets was called, um, and that's going to, he's going to lead us directly into our final song that Melanie will lead, and then we will be dismissed to the fellowship hall. That will never happen to anybody who comes to Jesus Christ as priest. He's priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, based on the character of life that he has. And because he lives forever, he saves forever. And so we're saved by Jesus and we're perfected forever, those who are sanctified. We're perfected forever because we are given to God on the basis of the perfect obedience of Jesus. If, if it depended on our human record, if it was up to our faithfulness to determine whether we were saved or not, then it would be a matter of every day God having to re-examine the record and several times through the day say, well, you're okay right now. Oops, sorry, you just slipped. Well, now you're back in, ups, you're out again. Today is a good day, tomorrow could be better, but it could be worse. There's no certainty, there's no assurance, there's not much hope. And the sad thing is that a lot of people who think they're Christians and who think they're following Jesus Christ and who think they've learned the gospel live that kind of life of uncertainty. And so they say, well, at age 85, after a very long Christian life and a life full of good works, they come to their deathbed and say, well, I hope I've done enough that I might squeeze in and be saved. Folks, we don't squeeze in. Jude says God will give you an abundant interest <laughs> because it doesn't depend on our little lives. If it depended on our ability and our record and our history, we wouldn't even squeeze in. God would just say there's not even a close call, scram, other place with you. But we come, we come with an abundant interest because we come on the basis of the name and the righteousness and the blood of Jesus Christ 
and he did it right. If he did it perfectly, it's because he did it perfectly. He only needed to do it one time, and God raised him from the dead, and he is made priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. God is pleased with his life. He's pleased with his priesthood. He's pleased with his intercession. He's pleased, therefore, with his people. And Jesus lives forever, and he saves forever, and he intercedes forever, and we can come to him forever. There's no reason for any of God's people ever to fall away. There's no reason for any of God's people ever to drop out. There's no reason for God's people ever to get discouraged and quit. There's no reason for God's people ever to think they've been overwhelmed, overcome, or outdone. Because Jesus came as a human being and a human body, did the will of God perfectly every day of his life, defeated the devil, conquered death, brought in life, brought in the one sacrifice for sin that takes care of it forever and always and every part of its effects rose from the dead, ascended to heaven, sitting at the right hand of God, and he says, I'm here, I'm one of you. We have a priest at the right hand of God who is one of us, who's done it right, who's done it perfectly, who lives forever, who saves forever. And God says, come up and see me any time you want to. <laughs> Call on me when you need something, because I'm here for you, and my son is here, and he's one of you. He's your brother. He's been where you've been. He's lived your life. He's suffered your suffering. He's been tempted with your temptations. He's died your death. He's been judged your judgment. And it's all straight between me and him. And if you come in his name, you could come right in without even knocking. So that's the kind of priest we have. That's the kind of Savior we have. That's the kind of salvation we have. And he says, I'm here for you. I've done it. I've taken care of it. I've conquered the enemy. I've made interest to God. I've opened the door to heaven. I've paved the way to heaven. The path is clear. The Father is waiting. The priest is on your side. Draw near to him. And I stand here before you today not as somebody who's done all that right, but as somebody who's learned by being a flock, by being given great privilege of sinning many times nevertheless, by coming short of the glory of God, and the hope that I have is not a hope of knowing Greek. It's not a hope of going to school 20-something years. It's not a hope of even having godly parents. It's not a hope of being a righteous man. It's a hope of Jesus Christ, for my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is shifting sand. And we can all say the same thing who know and trust in Him. What more can we say except hallelujah, praise the Lord.